So, this is the first of three video segments covering the topic of specialization, the gains from trade, and comparative advantage. And we're going to go ahead and start this with a basic version of what's called the Ricardian model. And this is based on work that an economist, David Ricardo, did back in the early 1800s, actually. And the idea is that we're going to have two countries, the US and Japan, and they can produce two goods, computers and wheat, and they have just one productive resource, labor. And we're going to go ahead and look at how much of the two different goods the, each country can produce and consume. First, if the countries choose to be self-sufficient and not trade with each other. And second, if each chooses to trade with the other country after specializing. The specific data for this model are the U.S. has 50,000 hours worth of labor, and it can use those to produce the two different goods. For every 100 labor hours it puts into computers, it can produce one computer. And for every 10 labor hours it puts into wheat, it can produce one wheat. Japan has 30,000 labor hours, and it takes 125 hours of labor in Japan to build one com computer, and 25 labor hours to create one wheat. And notice the U.S. can produce more for two different reasons. One is it has a larger labor force, and the second is that its labor force is more productive. It takes less labor to produce each of the goods in both countries. So this example is not symmetric. We're going to go ahead and have Jan Japan as both a smaller country, and if you think about it, it would be a poorer country because its workers can't produce as much in an hour. So if you think about what their yearly wages or yearly production would be, it would be lower. So we're going to suppose that when the countries don't trade, that they divide their labor forces equally between the two goods. And we're going to go ahead and have the U.S. put half of its labor force into wheat and half into computers. The half of its labor force is 25,000 hours, and each computer requires 100 hours worth of labor, so it produces 250 computers. The other half of its labor force is another 25,000 hours. Each wheat costs 10 hours of labor, so it can produce 2,500 wheat. And again, as a reminder, this is what we call our production possibilities frontier. So it maps out all the possible combinations of the two goods that a country can choose to produce, but they have to choose one point on here, and they can't produce both 5,000 wheat and 500 computers. It's an either or. Remember that we can go ahead and determine what the opportunity cost is of producing a good by looking at the slope of a PPF. So you could look at answering this question that way, or you could go ahead and look directly to the numbers in terms of the labor costs of the two different goods. Japan is also going to divide its labor force evenly between the two goods so that it's neither well-fed but bored with lots of wheat and zero computers, nor highly entertained with lots of computers but zero wheat. So it's going to go ahead and split its labor force. And if you do the math on that, you'll see that when Japan splits its 30,000 hours evenly between the two industries, it would get 120 computers and 600 wheat. Again, to brush up, and because we'll need this information later in this example, what is Japan's opportunity cost of producing one wheat? Notice that if you don't trade, your production is exactly equal to your consumption. So, without trade, U.S. consumers get 250 computers and 2,500 tons of wheat. Japanese consumers get 120 computers and 600 tons of wheat. And we'll want to keep that information in mind when we go to compare the situation before the country started trading with the situation after the country started trading. We're going to have each country specialize. 
and later on in one of the later video segments we'll explain why each country is specializing in each particular good. But for now, let's just work through this. We're going to have the U.S. partially specialize in producing wheat. So whereas the U.S. had been on the exact middle of this line before, we're having them shift up and to the left, so they're producing more wheat, but also less computers. So they're going to go ahead and produce 3,400 wheat and 160 computers. Just to make sure you can keep track of the math on this, go ahead and try and think through the following calculation. If the U.S. produces 2,000 wheat, how many computers can it produce with its remaining labor supply? Japan is going to entirely specialize in computers. So we're going to have them reduce their wheat production to zero and entirely put their labor force in computers. And so they produce 240 computers and zero tons of wheat. Now, each country is going to go ahead and trade. And of course, when you trade, you give away your exports. So U.S. wheat consumption is smaller than U.S. wheat production. So the U.S. produced 3,400 wheat. It exported 700 of it, which leaves 2,700 for domestic production and it produced 160 computers, and it imports 110 from Japan, so it actually gets to consume more computers than it produced, and it gets to consume 270 computers. And this sort of point that when you export something, you're losing it, is often sort of lost on people. Often people think that exports are just 100% good, but remember, when you export something, you've gone to the effort of producing it, and used up some of your productive resources to produce it, but you don't actually get to consume it. Likewise, imports, you get to consume even though you didn't produce it. And if you kind of think about it, really the ideal situation would be we don't have to export every, anything at all, and other people just give us stuff for free. And that would mean that we would have zero exports and lots and lots of imports. So fundamentally, remember that exports, the reason why we export is that other people aren't willing to give us stuff for free. And they want some of our stuff in return for some of their stuff. Okay, so just on the level of the mechanics, we'll keep track of the fact that the U.S. has 270 computers and 2,700 wheat. And if you plot that point here, you'll notice that this gives us a combination of the two goods that the U.S. would not have been able to attain on its own. So just as we think about an increase in technology shifts the PPF out, we also can think about trade as a kind of technology. It allows us to attain combinations of the two goods that we otherwise couldn't. It's an intangible social technology rather than a nuts and bolts kind of technology. But really, technology does include ways of organizing things differently. And trade is one way of organizing the economy. Japan. Japan produces 240 computers. It exported 110 to the U.S., so it is able to consume 130. It didn't produce any wheat, but it imported 700 from the U.S., so it's able to actually consume 700 wheat. And if we plot that point, again, of 130 computers and 700 wheat, we'll see that it's beyond Japan's initial PPF. So again, Japan is able to consume a combination of the two goods that it couldn't otherwise. One thing to notice in all of this is the idea of the terms of trade. And that is the amount of wheat that is exchanged per computer. So it's kind of like the price. And notice that any trade where the U.S. pays less than 10 wheat per computer benefits the U.S. because the U.S. is giving up less wheat per computer than it would have to do if it just rearranged its own labor supply. Likewise, any time Japan is able to sell each computer for at least five wheat, it's going to make itself better off. 
because when Japan tries to sort of metaphorically buy more wheat by rearranging its domestic labor supply, it only gets five wheat for every computer that it gives up. So anything better than that is good for Japan. So a ratio of exchange or terms of trade that's more than five but less than 10 wheat per computer is going to be mutually beneficial. And that's going to happen in all these sorts of examples. For the trade to be mutually beneficial, the price must lie between the two opportunity costs, or the ratio of exchange or terms of trade must lie between the two countries' opportunity costs. Just going through the rest of this ledger, comparing consumption without trade and consumption with trade for the two different countries, we're going to see, again, that each country is able to consume more of both goods than it could without trade, and therefore each country is better off than it otherwise would be.